Welcome to Shift, everybody. If this is your first time here, we would love it if you would scan this QR code or the one back at the welcome area. And if you fill out that Connect card, we'll send you some free Opus coffee. And make sure you check out the Meet with Joe option so you can meet with Joe Smith while drinking that cup of coffee. And you can ask any and all questions that you want or need to know about Shift. Easter is next week and we still have a few volunteer spots open. If you would like to help, scan the QR code, check all the options that you're interested in, and the leader will contact you. Westminster is doing an egg hunt on Easter morning. They'll have snack and a story time at 10.30, and then the actual egg hunt will be at 11. So come in, check your kids in as usual, and you'll be escorted over to the new kids' room for all the fun festivities. And then once it's over, you go and pick them up from the new room. I'm excited to tell you about the series after Easter, Don't Throw the Day Away. We're gonna kick off the new series with guest speaker, Tamara Perry Leonardo. And it's gonna be awesome. You're not gonna wanna miss it, so mark your calendars now. That's all I have for you guys today. So now it's time for week four of our series, Easter Unveiled. Hey Shift, what's going on? We had an, uh, technical difficulties this week, all part of being in a shared space. I think that we've got everything ironed out unless something unforeseen happens beyond our control. But we wanted to re-record this for all of you that were, you know, are, are from afar or couldn't be here on, on in person. And uh, this week um, we're taking another look at um, the cross and asking, what does this mean? Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the yearly celebration of the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on, on a donkey. Um, it's also a day where we see heaven kind of crashing into the earth, into the earth, and we see these two opposing forces coming from opposite directions that will culminate in another answer to our weekly question, uh, what does this mean? Now, if you're new uh, online with us, uh, my name is Joe. I'm the lead pastor here, and we're in an Easter series that we've called Easter Unveiled. And each week we're taking a look at the cross of Christ and asking the question, what does this mean? Week one, it was the eternal moment of forgiveness that Jesus, in some sort of metaphysical way, absorbed all of the disease of sin and through that sacrifice, through his divinity, uh, healed that, um, that disease and that we can now choose to live in the forgiveness that's already there. Uh, week two was the icon of the invisible God, that the picture of Jesus on the cross is the clearest image of God's unchanging nature, love, and that we never have to wonder what God looks like, that he has always looked like and will always look like Jesus. Last week, it was the remaking of the world, and we looked at the ancient lie of Cain that the world must be ordered, must be ruled by those that have uh, that possess violent power, the power to kill. And we saw that this path is nothing but a reoccurring cycle of destruction that we all still feel today. And that the cross exposes that life for what it essentially is and remakes the world. And so today, today it means the the um Today, it means the overthrow of the Satan. And I won't spend a ton of time here, but the personification of the Satan or the devil isn't seen in the Hebrew scriptures or the Old Testament. Satan, or in Hebrew, Hasatan, was a role that was played and not a person. It was a title, such as an example of that is found in the Old Testament book, Numbers chapter 22, verse 22, where we see an angel of the Lord plays the Hasatan against somebody named Balaam. Um, and you'll have to look in the Hebrew for that. Um, you could go to Blue Letter Bible. It's a handy app and click on it and you can see that yourself. Or um, in Job where um, the Hasatan, the accuser, the adversary, um, is part of the sons of Elohim on something called the Divine Council. And they have come to present themselves to Jehovah. And that distinction of Elohim and Jehovah isn't in the English. You don't see it there, but it is in the Hebrew. And it was a role played by one of the sons of God. It isn't until that Greco-Roman time period that this role begins to take shape as an individual or the devil or in the Greek Diablos or Satanas um, in the New Testament. And whether you believe in an actual Satan or you believe that it's a, it's some sort of metaphor as evil personified doesn't really um, concern me either way. 
I personally uh, believe that the Satan or the accuser, the adversary, um, or the accuser, the adversary is less than a being, but more than a metaphor, almost a yes and rather than a binary either or. Now on Palm Sunday, we see Jesus riding in from the West on a donkey. And this is a purposeful fulfillment of a passage that was spoken 500 years before Jesus shows up on the scene. It's found in the Old Testament book of Zechariah, which says that Israel's king would ride into town humbly on a donkey. And as he does this, the crowds, which have swelled considerably because of Passover, see what he's doing. They recognize the symbolism. They grab these palm branches, and then they lay them alongside the road. And they begin to sing from Psalm 118. And we can see it in John's gospel in chapter 12, where it says, So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Now, it gets lost on us. But this is an incredibly dangerous and overtly political act. Jesus is making a statement by doing this, and everyone present understands this. In Luke's account, chapter 19, we see that the Pharisees go to Jesus, and they're telling him, you've got to stop. Stop. Warn your disciples. Tell them to shut up. And Jesus is like, not today, man. Don't you know that even, even if I did tell them to shut up, that creation itself would cry out? And the Pharisees feared what might happen because there was another processional taking place, one coming in from the east, from the opposite direction. The Roman governor Pontius Pilate was making his yearly mandated visit. Normally, Pilate lived on the shore in the town called Caesarea, but during Passover, he was by law forced to be in Jerusalem because the Passover celebration was the celebration of Jewish liberation, which this year has a far different symbolism. And if there was ever going to be an insurrection, it would have happened during this week. So Pilate comes riding in on his war horse because there's always a dude riding on his war horse. And it's always a dude. He comes atop this symbol of violent power and this just overt display of strength designed for one thing, to absolutely intimidate the enemies of Rome, as if to say, don't even think about coming against us. Do you not see the power that I have behind me? all of this might, we have the power to crush you. We also have the power to let you live. Pilate would have been followed by just garrisons of foot soldiers and mounted soldiers, legions of war chariots. Uh, There would have been banners declaring Caesar as king, as their god. Um, Trumpets and um, drums echoing throughout the city to announce the image bearer of Rome's god was coming into town. If, if we were present, it must have been a truly terrible and awesome display of Rome's might. Herod Antipas was also in town, but Herod would have needed none of the pomp and frills of Pilate's military parade. While, Pilate, while Pilate's rule was from this position of overwhelming governmental force, Herod's power was economic. It came from vast wealth. Herod Antipas was one of the sons of Herod the Great and held the title of Tetrarch. He's also referred to as King Herod, but he never actually held that title king. Um, Herod Antipas was, um, he inherited part of part of his father's just enormous wealth that came from ruling over the spice trades in the ancient world. And it said that Herod the Great was the wealthiest human to ever walk the face of the earth. It's said that his wealth is so great that somebody that we, you know, like in our minds is like that top 1%, like Bill Gates, that Bill Gates would have mowed his lawn. So when Rome took over, they saw the opportunity to marry their governmental power and Herod's economic power, and Herod Antipas is the result of that union. Both men and the power that they represent played crucial roles in the crucifixion of Jesus. And without these two, it doesn't take place. This would not have happened. But there was also a third power present, and it was this third power that is the driving force behind the satanic plot, and that third power was religion. And the early church had a lot to say, had much to say about uh, this particular type of power. In the letter to the church in Ephesus, the author says this in chapter 6, For our struggle is not against blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And the author goes out of their way to say that this battle that we face is not against people. 
People are not the enemy. It's against the unseen power behind people. It's against an evil that lurks just beyond our vision that's pulling string, strings in the dark. And it's these three men and the power that they represent that we see the clearest picture of the Satan in the crucifixion story. And I can I can understand I can understand governmental power crushing its enemies, right? Like government doesn't doesn't care about you. Government doesn't care about me. It doesn't care about us. Government will use us. And when it gets when it gets whatever it wants, right? It just tosses us out like yesterday's trash. And I can understand economic power kind of doing the same kind of things, right? I can understand economic power tipping that scale forever in its favor, right? Economic power buys politicians. Politicians make the rules, create the system, and keep it so unbalanced that the that and so unfair that the rich will always be rich and the poor will always be poor. Uh, these powers and principalities are still at work today. We all feel the ramifications of this, and we all suffer from these evils. But it's that third power. It's that third power that I just can't wrap my mind around. It's the one, um, the one that completes this unholy trinity. Uh, the one that's found in the only person that comes into this high drama with his eyes wide open, Joseph ben Caiaphas. Caiaphas, as he's known in the New Testament, was the high priest during the time of Jesus. He was credited with leading the plot to murder Jesus. He's the one that oversaw the, the trial um, with this, you know, prescripted outcome uh, this, uh, that was held by the religious ruling body in Jerusalem. And he had just become high priest that year, succeeding his father-in-law, Annas, who had been the high priest the previous 20 years. Caiaphas was the high priest of Israel. He was supposed to be their spiritual shepherd, their spiritual leader, but he had become corrupt. And what always corrupts? Power. Power always corrupts. In fact, we now know that power alters our brain chemistry. And research suggests that having power can lead to structural, structural and functional changes in the brain, particularly in regions associated with reward, decision making, and then social cognition. It can even alter hormone levels with which further influences those things. Power literally rewires your brain, and this is why power will do whatever it takes to maintain power. And what Caiaphas wanted more than anything was power. And how does this kind of power operate? In the dark. Always behind the scenes. Always scheming. Always plotting. Anyone ever encounter a church leader or an elder or a pastor that operates like this? When we mix this kind of power with religion, you create a very sinister and special kind of evil. Leaders can convince themselves of anything if it's done in the name of God. Religious leaders will have affairs. They will steal money. They will abuse their own people. They will build their own private, personal empires and kingdoms and call it good. They'll bless it and excuse it by saying, but look at what God is doing. And any threat to that power is eliminated. This power is a very special and very harmful kind of evil. And I think I think that's why Pilate resisted Jesus. I don't think that Pilate resisted Jesus because he didn't think that he was the Messiah. I think that Pilate resisted Jesus because he thought that he just might be the Messiah. As I said, Caiaphas is the only one of the three that comes into this with his eyes wide open. In John's gospel, we see the chief priests talking about Jesus and talking about this in chapter 11. It says, what do we do? What are we to do? This man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. They knew. They knew the whole time, the entire time. Look, the people are siding with this itinerant preacher. If this keeps up, if he keeps preaching this stuff and they keep following him, our overlords are going to come in and destroy us. And then Caiaphas with all of his religious power, comes in with this satanic plot. Verse 49, but one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. You do not understand that it's better for you to have one man die for the people than to have the whole nation destroyed. Thus begins the plot to murder Jesus. But how to do it, right? They can't just openly arrest him. They might have a riot on their hands. The common folk are rallying to Jesus. They need to figure out a way to do it in the secret, kind of in the dark. And that is how religious power always operates. It's never in the open. And it's in this darkness that insteps Judas Iscariot. 
one of Jesus's 12 disciples. Now, we don't know how this connection happened. But at some point in time, Judas and the high priest get together and they come up with this plot. They hatch this scheme for 30 pieces of silver. And any reason for Judas doing this is purely speculation. It might have been pure greed. One of the gospels kind of go out of their way to show that G uh, Judas was skimming off the top of their of the donations they got. Personally, I find that kind of hard to believe. Um, I find that hard to believe because of everything that he had been a part of, all the things that he had seen. And 30 pieces of silver just isn't that much. Even in today's, I mean, it's at its height, it's like 400 bucks. So it just doesn't make sense to me. I Personally, again, speculation, personally, I think that Judas did this because he felt like he would force Jesus's hand and that Jesus would reveal himself as Israel's messianic king like leading them to freedom, that this would in fact kickstart the revolution and begin the overthrow of the Roman government. In any case, don't be too hard on Judas. I mean, I know uh, I've seen plenty of Christians sell their savior, savior out for, for far less. I mean, just look at January 6th. So Judas tells them where Jesus is going to be. He leads them he leads the soldiers to Jesus, betrays Jesus with a kiss. Jesus is arrested. Caiaphas oversees this mock trial, right, with the predetermined outcome, but he can't do the deed himself. He needs Pilate on board to complete the plan because only Rome has the power to kill. And there's a problem with this. They clearly don't like each other. As Pilate is questioning Jesus, he tries to release him several times. And I don't think it's because Pilate was like especially sympathetic to this innocent Jewish preacher, he had zero qualms about murdering people. He crucified plenty of people. I think it's just because he doesn't like Caiaphas and he wants to make it difficult. At one point, Pilate tries to release him and Caiaphas out there prodding this crowd along, they yell out, if you don't crucify this man, you are no friend of Caesar. But Pilate's no newbie, right? Like he's not a rookie at this. He knows how to play the game and he's got one more trick up his sleeve. And he says, but but don't you Jewish people, don't you all believe in this? Don't you believe in a Messiah, a king? Do you want me to crucify your king? And it's right here that Caiaphas has this real moment of truth where just for a split second, he takes off his mask and reveals his true self. And he it's almost, Pilate, you have your military might, right? You have your military might and your government of power. And Herod over there has his economic power. And we all want the same thing. We all want to be as close to Caesar as possible. You do it your way, Herod does it his, his way. And I will use my way. I will use religion to accomplish the same thing. Oh, I will say the right words. I will wear all the robes and I'll give all the blessings. But make no mistake, in the end, we're all the same and want the same thing. And then he utters maybe the most satanic sentence in all of scripture. John 19, 25. We have no king but Caesar. This is a deep, deep betrayal of his faith tradition. Of all the people and the prophets and the priests that came before him, even every Jewish boy and girl knew that the true confession is that Israel has no king but Yahweh. And at this stunning betrayal of everything that he's supposed to hold up, Jesus is taken away to be crucified. But don't forget what Jesus said he would accomplish at this moment. John chapter 12. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Caiaphas had come to believe that true power is found in the lie of Cain and the lie of Satan. That power comes from the ability to kill, to oppress, and to dominate. But the cross exposes that lie and puts it to shame. And this is why the author of Colossians says this about the cross it says, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them by triumphing, triumphing over them. At the cross, Jesus comes to his glory, comes into his glory, absorbs the disease of sin, shows us the true picture of God and exposes the inherent evil, violent, the evil violence present in the world system. Some versions put it this way. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. And this is a bold and radical theological statement because to be crucified was to be shamed. And we forget that. Yes, 
the the cross was so painful that the word excruciating was invented to describe it but don't forget the immense amount of shame that came upon the person being crucified in their family but in the cross of christ jesus shines light on this evil exposing it for what it is and in doing so heaps shame on it overthrowing the satan in the process typhus thought he had gotten rid of his of this threat to his power However, it was this brutal act of satanic violence that helped galvanize Jesus's followers. And this is nothing new. Like we've experienced this and we saw it most powerfully in 2020 when the murders of three innocent people, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery were killed by brutal governmental power. The news waves it created started this ripple effect that this generation had never experienced before, had never seen before. And it was the scapegoating of these three innocent people that brought shame to the powers of the Satan. And at the time, we may not have seen it that way, but this is the same spirit of power and principalities that Jesus defeated on the cross. This is the overthrow of the Satan, of powers and principalities. And once these powers were exposed for what they were in the light of Christ, we see that they are not, in fact, any kind of leadership at all. This is what true leadership looks like. It is co-suffering love. It is the cross of Christ that brings truth to the world, that the ancient lie of Cain is no more. It is the truth that Jesus said brings freedom. So if you ever see a place where people are being oppressed, being dominated, it is not of truth and cannot be of God. The Satan and the power behind it have been shamed and humiliated. And that is the salvific work of the cross. It throws down the sinister triumvirate this collective force seen as Satan and saves or heals humanity. And now Jesus is drawing all of us to himself by the finished work of the cross. Salvation is collective because the defeat was collective. None of us are saved. We are being saved. And none of us are saved until we're all saved. None of us can be free while some of us still languish in bondage. Our work now, our work in this is to be drawn into this new world, to be pulled by this gravity of grace. And we cannot make the same mistake as our spiritual ancestors. This is not a private grace that we sit in. We now, we now participate in the ongoing overthrow of the Satan by bringing this grace and freedom to our world. And hear me when I say this, I'm not talking about going door to door or speaking truth and love. I'm talking about bringing a very real and tangible felt grace and freedom. And what that looks like will be different for all of us. My work looks different than your work and your work looks different than mine. My personal story has led me to where I am. And the spirit of God, the spirit of truth has led me out of my bondage to the powers and principalities. And I am blessed enough to now get, that I get to work against it. And I invite all of you listening to do the same, to invite you into this same work. Start with your own undoing, the crucifying of the ego of the first life. Bury that old nature, that old way of living, or as the scriptures describe it, the old man. Take that, take that oldness, that old way of doing it, that old way of living, the old way of seeing it, and burying it and bury it alongside the powers, the rulers and authorities. It's all the same graveyard. Leave it and then rise with the same resurrection power of the Christ. Allow that spirit to guide you into all truth. Be part of the things that Jesus said he came to do in Luke chapter four. Bring good news to the poor. Um Proclaim release to the captive, sight to the blind, and freedom to the oppressed. I, I, I invite all of you to enter into this eternal way of life. All of that and so much more. Because today, today this means the overthrow of the Satan. And if you're new, we end each gathering with a time of reflection. And we do that to allow you the space to listen to your body and to listen to the spirit. Normally, if, you're, if we're in person, the band comes back up but there'll be music playing, so it's not an awkward silence. And I'll ask you a few questions to guide the process. I will pray for us, and when uh, we're in person, and you can do this sitting at home as well, uh, we, we take a moment to, to have communion. Uh, each week, we reflect on what we've heard and learned, and today, let it remind us that we are no longer under the yoke of the accuser, that we have been given freedom from the powers and principalities, and that they have been brought low to shame. My first question to you today is this. As you listen today, what thoughts came forward? What images? 
what is God saying to you through them? How have the powers and principalities brought evil to our world? How can we overcome this particularly hidden evil? How can you open your eyes to that hidden evil, hidden level of evil that impacts everyone? And how do we expose it to the light of Christ? My last question is this, how can you personally overcome the want, the lust for these powers and then live in the way of Jesus? Let's pray. Co-suffering God of the cross, we are thankful for the work of the cross and what it means today. I pray that we examine our own hearts and thoughts and search for ways that we knowingly and unknowingly participate in the powers of this deep demonic mechanism. Help us to expose those things and bring shame to them. And I ask that as a community, we do the work of bringing this very tangible freedom to our city. Forgive us for things done and for things undone and let us live in the forgiveness already there. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Bring comfort to the afflicted, healing to the broken, and freedom to the chained. In your name, amen. Well, Schiff, thanks for following along and being a part of this. Uh, hopefully next week there will be zero issues as it's Easter Sunday, and uh, we're planning for a, a big celebration and a culmination of our final answer to the question of what does this mean? Uh, I offered this to those that were in, in person, but I want to offer this to you as well, that for those of us that are kind of in that reconstruction uh, phase season of our lives, of our walk, and trying to figure out, you know, we're using these phrases and singing songs that we've that we've said for so many years, but now they they mean so many different things, right? And so I just want to put this out there to anybody that's watching this, that if you need somebody to talk to, um, even if it's virtually, let me buy you a cup of coffee, let's sit down, let's meet zoom or in person and let's talk through those things what it looks like i don't have all the answers um but i am in such a better and healthier place than i was uh, even a few years ago and i want to i want to be part of that with you so I, I offer that to you so feel free to reach out to us um, you can shoot me an email joe at shiftgnv.com or if you've got my number or if you follow me on social media message me uh, but yeah, if you're if you're close in Gainesville or the surrounding areas, we would love to have you come be a part of our, our Easter celebration and all that we're going to talk about. Uh, our final week is the death that defeats death, and uh, it's going to be a good one. So yeah, hope to see you there in person or online. Anyway, get out of here. Go love on some people.